in our church family and for the, for the whole country and the world to try to get through all this madness that's been going on. But if we keep the faith in Jesus Christ, we'll, we'll get through it. Father God, please protect everyone in anything they do, in, in all that they do, and protect them on their way home as well, but through this uh, pandemic, and show them the actual way that you're going to actually protect them. In, the, in, in, every, in anything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God will make a way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my love and strength for each new day he will make a way he will make a way oh God will make a way where there seems to be no way he works 
know out there that he does love us no matter what no one can tell us any different he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy
And Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to gather together and worship you. And as our hearts and hands are lifted up in praise to you, Lord, may it prepare our hearts for the word that has been given this evening. And again, Lord, would you put your hand of protection uh, uh, over your people and uh, speed the healing, strengthen those that need that. In your holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Scott, I feel like I'm echoing a little bit here, Scott, a little echoing here. Praise the Lord. Won't you wave at someone? Won't you greet someone in the house of the Lord tonight? We reach out to those of you that are home, those of you that are homesick and, you know, recovering and getting better. We just pray nothing but a speedy recovery to all of your lives. And to all of you that are here today, we also um, pray blessings and healings upon your lives, your families, we pray that this can become a, a good Christmas season despite all the changes we have to go through. Praise the Lord. Well, it is good to be here tonight in the house of God, is it not? It's a lot warmer inside here than outside, obviously. I, I'm feeling super pumped tonight. I don't have to put the air condition on. It means I don't have to spend any of the church's money with our electric bill. Boy, I'm telling you, it's a great night for me tonight. But um, it is good to be here um, in the house of the Lord, and, and I'm, just, I'm just excited. This, this coming Sunday, um, it is Communion Sunday, so I always like um, when we have communion time to gather around the Lord's table. Of course, the whole year we've been doing a little different. We've been giving out these you know, little mobiles, little, little communion cups, but um, it's always great to, to remember what the Lord has done for us, let me tell you. And that's what we do every time we come together for communion. But tonight, before we take up the offering, I'd like to go over a few announcements. As you know, that... Um, we are, you know, still in that social distancing mode tonight. Being that we have a low crowd, it's very easy to social distance tonight. But um, we're going to be doing that throughout the month of December, maybe even into January. But I want you to pray with me and, and believe with me that it's going to be just an awesome spring. Amen. It really is. When this winter's over with, man, we're going to have an awesome spring. It's going to be a great time, and, and we're going we're gonna to see things get back to some type of, of normality here in, in our lives. I really believe that. But I also want to encourage you, if you're able to, if you're not away with your families and things of that nature, that we are going to be having a one-hour Christmas Eve candlelight service on Thursday, December 24th at 5 p.m. People, some people have asked me, why so early? Why instead of 6 like you did last year, you're doing it at 5? The reason is because not only myself, but several of, of you may be traveling, going out of town, got family in other cities here in Florida, and you might... Um, be able to come to something like this and still go to your family festivities if, by, by doing it a little bit earlier, okay? So it's just going to be an intimate time um, speaking about Jesus being the light of the world and having the candlelight. It's just those that went to it last year know what I mean. It was a very special time, and we do invite you, if you can, to come to this one as well. Also, our kids' church and our youth group are both having their little parties. We're not having a church-wide party, but they're having their little parties for Christmas on December 20th. They're encouraged to bring a $5 wrapped neutral gift, meaning not for boys or girls, just a neutral gift. They're having like what's called like a white elephant type of exchange, and that's always a fun time, as well as an ugly Christmas sweater contest. So um, the kids will have a great time in that. And also, just for the month of December, because of the sicknesses and the holidays and all that kind of stuff, Monday night prayer will be postponed for the month of December. You could pray at your houses, you could pray in your cars, but we won't be gathering here. We're trying to keep some of that down for the month of December. So um, just, you know, work with us with some of this stuff, and we're trying everything we can to keep the church open for services throughout the month because um, there's so many that are just closing down, and we don't want to do that. So try to work with me on some of these things. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and um, take up our offering at this time. So you all know the drill. We've been doing it for a year now. So, Father God, in Jesus' name, we're going to go ahead and give to you tonight, God, a portion of what you blessed us with. And we ask you, God, to, 
to use it for the furtherment of your kingdom. And we ask you, God, as we're faithful to you, you continue as always to be faithful to us and meet our needs in our lives. So bless this offering tonight to your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So why don't we just start on this side and work our way across. If you have anything to give to the Lord tonight, please feel free to give something to the Lord. If, and if no one has nothing, then we're just going to trust God that he'll just provide anyway, supernaturally tonight. So. that there's often times, at least once, every time, every, every week actually, that, um, thank you for your giving by the way, but every week I come into the sanctuary, I spend time with the Lord, and I kind of go over the message, I, I, I share it before angels and before these seats, the, the message, and I'll have a pen with me, and I'll tweak a few things that God gives me along the way, and, and there have been times that I've even thrown on the, that, that CD, just, uh, you know, the offering CD, and I say, you know, the, and I'll sing a little bit of it to see how it sounds. And with nobody in the building, I actually hear booze in the spiritual. I hear booze in the spiritual, so I just turn it off. I don't even try it. So I have tried to sing that song, but it doesn't sound good coming out of my, my mouth, unfortunately. <laughs> but it is good to be here tonight in the Lord. Um, I know we're few tonight, and I know that there's so many at home getting better watching this via the stream. So we do give a shout-out to all of our brothers and sisters at home um, I got my wife and Nancy off this morning to the airport. They should be probably arriving in Texas as I speak right now, if everything went okay. You know, our, our air system is a, is a strange thing. You know, they, they leave out of Orlando, and they fly to Baltimore, Maryland, then back down to San Antonio, Texas. Now, does that make any sense? doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but that's what they did. And I saw a picture on Facebook. Millie was inside the cockpit of, a, of the plane I said, I hope she's not flying the plane, man. This is not good. Jack will never see his wife again, I'll tell you right now. But um, tonight I want to get into the Word of God. We don't have a long message, but I believe it's a message that has a punch to it. You know, when you think about salvation, and I hope we think about salvation quite often, it's easy to think of terms or attributes like faith. Got to have faith. Got to have faith in Jesus, right, to get to, to paradise, to get to heaven. I would hope that um, a, a, a word like love would come up. You must have the love of God in your heart. Love God. And words like, you know, commitment and faithfulness, being disciplined. You know, these are all words, attributes, attributes, if you will, that go with salvation, you would think. But there's one that I think sometimes we miss, and there's one that I'm really going to hammer home tonight. And and if you're doing this, man, you have nothing to worry about. But if you're not doing this, you're going you're gonna to get, get some correction tonight. And I want to speak to you tonight about obedience. In a message I've entitled, Obedience is at the very heart of a relationship with God. I believe that just like faith, just like love, just like, you know, commitment, these kind of words are right there at the center of our relationship with God, so is obedience. I'm here to tell you tonight that though we don't work our way to heaven, because if you don't work, we can boast about working. It's all about grace of God. But if you and I are not obedient to what God has called us to do, if we are not obedient children, it's hard for me to believe we're going to make it to heaven. We have to be obedient. Obedient to what the Father is telling us to do this side of heaven. So tonight I'm going to be speaking about obedience at the, very, is at the very heart of a relationship with God, and I pray that it does speak to you tonight. So Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you tonight to speak to us in this building, to speak to those that are at home watching this via the stream. We pray, God, tonight in Jesus' name, you will give us the ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. And that tonight, God, we will take obedience very seriously tonight, God. And that, God, we will leave this message tonight you know, with obedience to your word, obedience to your spirit, obedience to the very will of God tonight. 
And I pray, dear God, that you will bless it and anoint it to your glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by reading to you a, 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 a parable, if you will, a, a, something that Jesus said found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32, if you're taking notes. Here's what Jesus says. He says, what do you think? He said, there was a man who had two sons, and he went to the first one and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. The son said, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Jesus said, which of the two of these did what the father wanted? And they said to him, well, the first one. Then Jesus says to them, truly I tell you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe in him. But tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. Now think about this for a minute. This is very powerful. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. And he went to the first son, first, first son and said, son, I want you to work in my vineyard. He said, I'm not going to do it. Hey, maybe you're the rebellious son. Maybe, maybe the guy just had other things to do. Maybe he didn't feel like doing it. It was a day off from work. But he said, you know what, after thinking about it, he said, I'll go ahead and do it. I'll go work. But the other son said, yes, sir, I will. I'll do it. But Jesus said he never did. But then Jesus went ahead and changed the whole thing around, and he said, you know, there are tax collectors and prostitutes that are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. Do I need to tell you tonight that in Jesus' days, tax collectors and prostitutes were the lowest of the low? So he was saying the lowest of the low are actually making it into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. There's only one word to describe that. Ouch. Tax collectors and prostitutes are entering into the, into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. He says, because even after you saw this, saw that these people were repenting, the laws of the law were repenting and coming to know Jesus, you still didn't do it. You still didn't repent and do what God said for you to do. How many of you know tonight that as Christians, as adopted sons and daughters of God, it, that adoption brings forth to our lives a measure of responsibility? When we gave our life to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ adopted us into his family as sons and daughters, with that, with that comes family responsibility. And the family responsibility is to do what the Father says. He says it, we does it, case closed. See, as believers, we are responsible for the sacred trust given to us by God. We are responsible for spreading the gospel message. We are responsible for advancing the kingdom of God. We are responsible for walking out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are responsible. We have, gotten, we have been given a, a, a responsibility by God to be obedient to the sacred trust, to spread the gospel message, to advance the kingdom of God, and to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. It is a responsibility given to us by God when we say to God, I do. No different when you make wedding vows, you say, I do. When we said, I do to God, we say, we'll do whatever you say. But yet, Jesus told the disciples that tax collectors and prostitutes were entering the kingdom of God ahead of them. I wonder how many tax collectors and prostitutes of our day are entering the kingdom of God ahead of those of the church. Simply because of our lack of obedience. See, obedience is essential for belonging to God's family. In other words, you and I can't really be a part of God's family unless we're obedient to what the Father says to do. You see, Matthew twelve fifty, Jesus says this right here. He says, For whoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same then is my brother, sister, and mother. Don't you remember this thing right here when Jesus was inside a, either a house or a synagogue or where he was at? He was teaching, and Mary and his brother and sister came outside to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they said, hey, Master, your, your mother and brother and sister are outside. They want to talk to you. And he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? Aren't they the one that does the will of my Father who's in heaven? Now, he wasn't putting down Mary or his brother and sisters. He was, he was making a point here. 
You, you, blatantly, you blatantly call them my mother, brothers, and sisters, but really my mother, brothers, and sisters are those who do the will of the Father. It was his way of, of laying down some groundwork there. You see, religious words, to me, do not result in salvation. Obedience results in salvation. Obedience results in salvation. Those who what? Confess with their heart, their mouth, believe in their, in their heart, right? Will be saved. But if more than just confessing and believing, it's doing. Did not Clint said again Sunday that the message is still ringing over and over and over. Do not be hearers, but be doers. Doers are those who are obedient. Obedient to the, to the cause of God. Here's another one that Jesus says in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Think about this. Jesus is saying this over and over in different gospel message. He's saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You know, several years ago, I said something to the congregation that had a lot of people just shaking their heads. And I know you might say, well, that happens on a weekly basis. But I said something years ago that I'm going to say again tonight because it's so true. And that was, do you know that, I have, that you have to let me pastor you? You have to let me pastor you. You have to let God be master over you. If we are not willing to submit to God's authority and submit to being obedient to God's will and ways, how are we ever going to do it to our earthly shepherd? If we don't do it to a heavenly shepherd, are we going to do it to an earthly shepherd? I doubt that. See, we have to allow, we have to say to ourselves, he is not just my brother in Christ. He is just not my friend. He is just not my husband or my father here on earth or my neighbor. He is my pastor. I'm going to respect his office. I'm going to respect his call. I'm going to respect that he speaks on behalf of God to my life. If we don't do that, then we're never going to really walk in obedience to the word of God given by the shepherd of the house. And the same thing goes for God. If we don't respect that God is, that Jesus is speaking in his word about the will of the Father for our lives, and we don't take that word seriously, we'll never walk in obedience to God. A man like myself or, or Clint or some other teacher will, will say the words to you, and you'll be like, well, that's his opinion. No, it's God's opinion. It's what God says for us to do. How about Matthew 7, 21? Jesus says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Again, it goes back to obedience, doing the will of the Father. Here we find it in three different passages, doing the will of my Father. See, obedience in action is, 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 is action is not only words. And I believe that obedience in action is what's essential for you and I to make it to heaven. It isn't just saying, well, I believe in God. Guess what? Satan believes in God, and he's not going to heaven. The Bible says he shudders. We can't just go through life saying, I believe. You know, I'm a good boy or girl. I pay my tithes. You know, I come to church on a regular basis. You know, I smile when the pastor speaks. I don't fall asleep. No, it's, it's, it's being obedient, doing what God says for us to do. And that might be as simple as if God tells you to, say something, to speak to somebody in a supermarket, you speak to them. If God says, volunteer for something at church, that, that there, there's an opportunity there, and God's pricking at your heart to be involved and do it. I wonder how many times in the past, back in the summertime, when we were cutting grass on Thursdays, and Jack Sigmund sitting over there with that bad Florida Gator shirt on. That's the wrong shirt to wear. But, but Jack Sigmund, I wonder how many times when he sent out that email saying, you know, we could sure use some help on Thursdays. I wonder how many of us saw it and said, I really, really wish I could, but I can't because of work or something else. But other, others of us saw it and said, no, I, I don't think I want to do that. And God's saying, I want you to do that. Well, no, I don't think so. See, it's disobedience. And God wants us to be obedient. You see, from the very beginning of, the, of, of, of creation, the very beginning of the, of the, in the Garden of Eden, if you, know, if you want to be honest with you, God began to set forth obedience and salvation, how obedience and salvation really worked hand in hand when he was talking to Adam and Eve. You know, it says here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, that God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now get this. 
You know this, this scripture. But sometimes we know things, but we don't really put them into, into, really, you know, in, in, into true thought. He says here, you are free to eat from any tree. It means any tree in this garden you can have but that one. Don't we see that today a lot? The very thing we don't want, that's the thing we want the most. The very thing we can't have, that's what we have to have. You ever see your kids? You can't have cookies up in that cookie jar. Now, you can have all this fruit on the counter. You can have all They don't want the fruit. They want them cookies in that cookie jar. And when you turn your back, that toddler, man, he's climbing. And you catch him with the, with the hand of the cookie jar, where that saying came from. There's something about the nature of the flesh that always wants what is told you can't have. And God says here, you can, have, you can eat from any tree in this garden but that one. Because if you eat from that one, you will certainly die. Right there, God was testing their obedience. If you be obedient to my will of the Father, you will live. If you don't be obedient to it, you will die. And what they do? The serpent deceived her. She gave the fruit to her husband. They both ate. Sin came into the world, and we're a byproduct of that sin today. We've all born with a sinful nature. And now they have to work the ground by the sweat of their brow like you and I are today. Women are having pain and in birth, in birth, giving birth, and all that. Why? Because of a lack of obedience, because of disobedience. See, obedience is a condition to one abiding in paradise. To me, obedience is as important as humility, as faith, and as love. I think obedience is just as important, if not more so. Look what Revelation twenty two fourteen says. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they enter through the gates into the city. Look at that. He said, blessed are those, right, who do what? Who do his commandments. Now, we're not talking about just the commandments of Moses. We're talking about all the commandments woven through the word of God. And they're all through there. And when God gives these commandments, and he places them on the tablets of our heart, and we know what's, what to do, and we don't do what we know what to do, that's called sin. And he says here, those who, 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 who do his commandments, they have the right to the tree of life. I mean, in other words, they have the right to paradise. They have the right to enter into them pearly gates, the gates of the city. Those who do his commandments. In other words, those who are obedient to the Father's will. Has anybody can tell me through first four passages of Scripture, do you see anywhere in there where obedience is not essential for salvation? Because it is. See, God requires us to obey. He wants to see obedience in the life of his children, and he wants to see obedience even over those placed in authority over us this side of heaven. Do you know that? You know, this whole world now going crazy. This whole world wants to defund the police, and, and they don't want no police because of a few bad apples. So let's what? Because of a few bad apples, let's go ahead and not give any respect to all the authorities established by God. And they are established by God. God established the police. It's established by God. We have a few crooked politicians, or maybe more than a few, but we have quite a few politicians that are crooked. So let's say they're all bad. They're not all bad. Again, they're established by God. Same thing for ministers, same thing for school teachers, same thing for, for job supervisors and managers. On and on it goes. You're going to have good and bad and everything. But you, you do not dishonor the whole system that God established just because of a few bad apples. There's no justification for it, okay? You see, God created a system whereby everything has its being, everything moves, everything has its purpose, everything has its reason based on the will and knowledge of God. Remember I just said this, God created this system of life that we have today. He created it. And he did it so that you and I can, can live and move and have our being, so that you and I can worship him, so that you and I can have the life that we have today. And when we don't honor him and be obedient to him, his authority, and when we don't have the obedience to the authority of those over us on this side of, side of heaven, then we dishonor God and the plans he has for our lives. You see, first and foremost, we are subject to God's authority. But secondly, we are subject to the authority placed over us here on earth. For example, kids are subjected to their parents' authority. Employees are subjected to the employer's authority. 
Citizens are subject to the government authorities. And even us of the body of Christ, whether you want to believe so or not, we are subjected to our leaders, to our pastors and, and leaders of the, of, the, of the kingdom of God. This is part of the kingdom of God. And we are subjected to that. You, do you know that right now, if I went, even though I'm a pastor of this church, if I went on a mission trip, if a missionary invited me to go to, you know, Africa or someplace as his guest, if I went there, I'm under his authority. He is the missionary in that site, what he says I do. And he's doing it for the betterment of the, for the, betterment of the kingdom and for my safety. Not because he's trying to, you know, look, look past my authority as a pastor. The question is, if we know that, that we need to be obedient to God's authority, and if we know we have to be obedient to the authorities here on planet Earth, then why do we use the word why? Why? Why do I got to listen to him? Why do I got to listen to her? Why do I got to do this? You know? And I'm going to tell you why that why is still there in our lives, because it was also there in the children of Israel. If you look at the children of Israel, they always disobeyed God. And they went back to serving other idols and worshiping other things, and they always got themselves in trouble. And, and, they, and God had a word for them, and that word to describe his people were they were stiff-necked people. And they were people that he called disobedient. And it's so funny about this. Um, he, 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 would, he would deal with Moses this way. He would say, Moses, do you see your people? Isn't it funny when we're, when we're not doing right, God calls them Moses' people? You ever notice your kids that way? Us, us dads are famous for this. Whenever our sons and daughters are doing great things, making all A's, or just something spectacular, we go, that's my son, that's my daughter. But when they do something bad, we go, that's your kid. That's your son. That's your daughter. Same thing God did. God said, Moses, that's your kid. You know what? Let me tell you something. There have been, I've been 27 and a half years in the ministry. I've been nine and a half as a senior pastor. And I've got to be honest with you, I, I love you guys. I mean, I've had some great people, and I still do it in our church over the years. I've been so blessed. But I've had some over the years that have been a pain in the neck, to say the least. They really have. Okay? And I haven't told them that. I haven't spread that around. I try to love them anyway. That's my job. But I have spent many times on my face in the sanctuary to God. I say, God, you got to help me with this person. And I've heard that spiritual voice no different than Moses is saying, them are your people. Eddie, you deal with them. That's your people. And every time I'm here to tell you the, the culprit to the problem is disobedience. Do not want to do what the pastor said. Don't want to do what the youth pastor said or the, or the women's leader said or the worship team member, leader says. It's always disobedience every time. And, you know, if you really know how, how kings and, and lordship actually, actually is, you never say no to the king. If you say no to the king, you know what usually happens? Off with your head. But we say no all the time with no, with, no, with no second thought to it. You know, why do I got to be subjected to God? Why do I got to be subjected to, the, to my boss at work? He didn't deserve that position. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. I know more than he or she knows. Why do I got to listen to them? Because they're in charge. That's why. They're, 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 because they're in charge. You see, time and time again, we get this. And the reason why we get this, and it really started when we were kids. You see, when we were kids, the question of why started when we were children out of curiosity. Kids would ask their parents why because they want to know. They don't understand why. They're curious. Why do I got to do this or why do I got to do that? You know? So I did some research and they said that psychologists estimate that kids ask roughly 40,000 questions between the ages of two and five. And they do it out of curiosity. 40,000 whys, if you will, in a three-year period out of curiosity. So, to, to, so for us to really understand about obedience, we have, to, we have to come to grip with the why behind the why, okay? Why do I have to do this? Why did the sun rise? Why do I, we have to go to sleep at a certain time? Why, 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 okay? So the why question, while annoying, is a question to try to discover and learn about the truth of why we do certain things that we do, right? And, 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 and really, it's ignorance it's really, when you ask the question why, it's really ignorance seeking understanding, or better yet, it's observation seeking exploration. It's what why is really all about when you really get down to it. 
See, as children of God, we use them words also to our Father. Why? Anybody ever done that before? Why, God? I've been faithful. I've been tithing. I've been coming to church. I gave up alcohol for you years ago. I don't womanize. I don't do these things. Why did this happen to me? Why did my child get sick? Or why did I get into an accident that totaled my car? Or why, why, why? You know, we do that. Do we not do that? We say why. Why did a tornado come in my neighborhood and only destroy my house, nobody else's house? You know? Why is that? Why I got five umbrellas, I picked the one with a hole in it to go outside in the rain? Why? We do that kind of stuff. We do it as children. We do it to our Father. So tonight I want to, I want to give you some answers to the reason why. Why we, why we obey. And here's the reason why. Here's one of them. The reason why we obey God and His Word is because God is the Creator and we are the creation. The reason why we obey God is because He is the Creator and we are the creation. Do you remember that? You remember back years ago when they had to have the, the Cosby show on and, and Heathcliff, which is by Bill Cosby, he was the father, and, and, and Theo Huxtable was the son. And I remember when um, um, you know, Cosby, which is Heathcliff, said to his son Theo, he says, listen, I'm going to give you the reason why you do this. You do it because I told you to do it. And if you don't do it, remember this. I brought you in this world. I'll take you out of it. God brought us in the world. And at the snap of his fingers, he could take us out of it. He is the creator. We are the creation. He is the potter. We are the clay. He is the master. We are the slaves. He is the father. We are the children. The why is because he said so. That's why. You see, all through the word of God do we see that God is the creator. He created the heavens and the earth, the stars, the moon, all the animals that crawl on the ground, that fly in the air, and swim in the ocean. But out of all of his creations, his prized possession was you and I. We were created in his likeness and his image. Why were we created that way? To simply have relationship with him. Isn't that something? He made all these things, the six days of creation. And what do you say after every time he made something? This is good. This is good. But when he made Adam, he said, oh, this is very good. It's almost like saying, you know, I came close, but I didn't perfect what I was trying to do. And then he made Adam. He made man. You see, they, they're, they're the scientific world out there believes in evolution. They believe that we came from ape. We didn't come from ape. What happened was God made ape, and it was close to what he wanted, but it wasn't quite it. So he made man. Man may resemble ape, ape may resemble man, but they didn't come from each other. They came separately made by God. The ape was good, the man was very good, but he created it. And see, I like the way the psalmist puts it here. The Psalm 100, verse 3, the psalmist says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Think about this. He thoughts are for saying, listen, know that the, the Lord, he is God. He's setting the foundation. He said, he ain't your buddy. He ain't your homeboy. I, I told you all a while back that in my youth group, we had to have a T-shirt. The, the youth with the worm. I don't know where they got the T-shirt. I didn't make them. But the T-shirt says, Jesus is my homeboy. He's not your homeboy. He is God. The Lord is God. And here it says, he made us and we are his. Guess what? That you don't belong to yourself. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ, the Bible says you were born or purchased by his blood. You no longer belong to yourself. That's why it's so, it's so baffling to me when I hear a Christian say, well, this is mine. Nothing is yours. There is nothing yours. Your kids are not yours. Your house is not yours. Your clothes are not yours. The church is not ours. He just let us use it. He let us, he let us rent it out. He lets us be stewards of it. But it doesn't belong to us. Our very lives are his. And the psalmist says, and we are his people the sheep of his pasture. Now, look, I don't know a whole bunch about raising sheep, okay? But the little bit I do know is sheep don't instruct shepherds. Shepherds instruct sheep. But yet, we live in a time today where sheep try to instruct shepherds. Think about that. So if, we're not, if we worldly sheep, earthly sheep, will not accept direction from earthly shepherds, how are we going to take direction from a heavenly shepherd who we can't even see? Just think about it. 
Some of you are thinking back in your minds or saying, man, who, who, who got him upset this week? Nobody got me upset. I'm fine. Only thing got me upset is COVID. I'm not upset about nothing else. I'm just sick of COVID already. But know that the Lord, he is God. He has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. But look what, look what Paul says in Colossians 1.16. He says, for in him, him being God, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Look at this. All things, not some things, all things were created by him and for him. And he says everything, heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities, it was all created by him. And guess what? It was all created for him. You ever create something that you, just, you, you made for yourself? You did your garden for yourself or you made some kind of, some kind of you know, vase at, at, or out of clay for yourself? God made you and I for himself. And if he did, doesn't he deserve to make the rules? And all he's asking us to do is to be obedient. To be obedient to the Father's will and to love him is what he wants from us. We first must obey him and, and, and what his authority is over our lives, and then we must obey those authorities that he places over us this side of heaven. For example, here tonight, you notice how no one ever gives credit to a, when you look at a painting, they very seldom give credit to the paint or the pastels or the canvas. They always give credit to the artist, Picasso or whatever. They never talk about, oh, that's an awesome canvas that he painted that on. No, it's always to the artist. We are the paint. We are the pastels. We are the canvas. God is the artist. He's the one that deserves all the credit and all the honor for everything that we have in our lives. So we must praise him. We must obey him. We must know that the reason for the answer, why do we are obedient to him and to the authorities around us, is because he is the creator and we are the creation. He says it. We do it. That settles it. That's where it's at. I'll give you another reason why we should, though. Obedience brings order, and order brings justice. Okay? Laws are not meant to be broken. Laws are meant to be kept. Laws are put into place to bring order, for that order in turn will bring justice. The reason why we have checks and balances in our country, for example, the reason why we have law and order is so that each one of us can be safe. So we can go out there with the same set of rules that everybody else has, and we're all playing on them rules, and we're all going to be safe. And when you break the rule, there's a place called jail that you go to. There's only two places you go to when you break the rules here in, in America. You go to jail or you go to the grave. And that's what God is saying. He said these, these, He said through obedience, obedience brings order, and order brings judgment. You see, we witnessed this past year, have we not, what happens when you have no law. We've seen cities being burned down. In the midst of cities being burned down because of, because of this lawless behavior, we see lives being lost. We have seen jobs being, jobs being taken away. We see a society that was once civilized becoming an uncivilized society overnight. Why? Because the people did not honor God's laws and refused to honor the laws of the land. When you have a law... And, you, and the police come out to, to, to stop you from doing it, you're breaking the law, and you dishonor that law, there's only one word to describe it. It's called lawlessness. And that comes from disobedience, period. See, God sets the rules and the laws for our lives to be governed, and them laws that he sets forth are in the, are, are his pages of the Bible that we read every day. That's his standard for godly living. And he took them laws, and he woven them into our constitution, and he woven them into our court system and the laws of the land to govern us so that we can have order and justice in our land. But guess what? If people do not honor God's laws, they're not going to honor the laws of the land as well. You see, in the, in the pages of the Bible, we see do's and don'ts. We see can'ts and can'ts and can'ts. And there's a process that brings forth justice, that brings forth order, and also brings forth righteousness. But it all stems from disobedience. If people are not obedient to God's authority, first and foremost, and then trickles down to be obedient to the authorities around them, 
you're not going to have any order, nor are you going to have any justice. All you're going to see is lawlessness, and people are going to get hurt. And that's what we've seen this past year, have we not? You see, when we disobey the laws of God first, then nothing left but lawlessness of man. And when that happens, then you disrespect all laws and all and honor no God, nor do you honor one another. You see, police officers, school teachers, pastors, employers, parents, even one another, we should be honoring. You know that we should be honoring one another? We really should. Do you know that the Bible says that the church judges the church? But God judges those outside the church. That's where we get that saying, be your brother's keeper. But yet, do you know that I've seen so often when an individual in decency and in order and in respect and love at the right timing when nobody around had taken a brother or sister aside using the word of God to bring correction in their life for something they said or did, Instead of heeding that correction and receiving it, no, they get mad and cause all kinds of ruckus. That disobedient to the laws God sets up when he says the church judges the church or you to be your brother's keeper. So we don't just dishonor God or disobedient to God. We're really disobedient to one another when we don't allow ourselves to be corrected by a brother or sister. And there's another word to put there. That word is called pride. Doesn't, doesn't pride come before a fall? Hello, somebody, you know. But there are two kind of authorities that God sets up that we are to be obedient to. And one, one authority is called the physical authority, and the other authority is called the spiritual authority. authority. And I'm going to show you a little scripture on the, the physical authority. It's found in Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Look what, look what Paul says here. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. He says, for there is no authority except that which God has established. He says, the authority that exists have been established by God. He says, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. He says, do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, he says, be afraid, for the ruler do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but as a matter of conscience. Then he says, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. He said, if you owe them taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Pretty powerful stuff here. God is saying he puts these authorities in our lives, this side of heaven, over us, okay, to keep the peace, to keep the order, to, to bring forth justice, to, to bring forth his rule. And he says right here, it's so, it's so powerful when he says right here, he says, listen, you have nothing to fear if you do what's right. If you do what's right, you really have nothing to fear. You know what's so powerful about, about that statement? I'm going to get to it just a little bit later, but how our own actions causes wrath to God on our lives, and then we want to blame somebody else. He said, if you do what's right, you have nothing to fear. But if you do what's wrong, these people have been put there on purpose by God to carry out his wrath for your disobedience. That's, that's the physical laws of obedience. But I'm going to give you the spiritual laws, and the spiritual laws are really found within the frameworks of the kingdom of God. Do you know this is not just a church with four walls where we have worship and teachings and, and you know, ministry activities. It's what, what's, what it's called is it's called, it's called being part of the kingdom of God. See, there, there are two kingdoms. There's kingdom of the world and kingdom of God. And we are part of the kingdom of God. And what goes on within the kingdom is, 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 is ministry. It's authorities. It's the carrying out of a process. And God places men and women of authority over the believers of Christ within the framework of the kingdom. 
And as we become obedient to God's word and as we rise up in the so-called rankings and, and show God that we can be responsible with small things, then some of us who at one time were taking orders, now we're the one giving the orders. But it works as far as part of God's kingdom, as part of God's system. I'll give you an example. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourself, for they watch over your souls, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that, he says, is unprofitable to you. Listen, don't we say that God loves a cheerful giver? He doesn't love, he doesn't, he doesn't reward a, a grudging giver. Okay, there, there's nothing rewarding about that. And it says here that these people, whether it be Pastor Eddie, whether it be other leaders in your lives, they, they, are there to, they are there over you, not to be like masters over you, but they're to be leaders over your lives, okay, because they watch over your soul. It means they're watching over your well-being in the Lord Jesus. And we have to give an account to God that we were obedient to what God told us to do. Okay, and it says here that allow, remember I said about allow me to pastor you, allow me to do this unto you with joy, with joy, because if I don't do it with joy, then it doesn't profit you at all. For example, there's some people, when I see their phone call show up, their name show up on my caller ID, I go, oh, praise God, I, I, that sister and that brother, hey, how you doing? But others, you go, oh, man, oh, I don't know if I want to answer this phone call at all. It's like, it's, like, it's like a knife being stabbed in your belly, man, you know, because it's just been nothing but problems, okay? There's no joy in it. And I'm not saying that every phone call got to be one of joy. It doesn't. But even in a crisis, it could be joyful. You know, Pastor, I really need your help now. Can you help me with this or can you help? That's fine. But it's like just, ugh, you know, like a cancer in your bones type of thing sometimes. So he says, do it with joy, so that way it will be profitable to you, okay? I'm going to share something with you right now that I promise you will get some of you upset with me. Now, before you get upset with me, remember that I, I, am, I am not only your pastor, but I am your brother in Christ, and I am your friend. I, there's not a person in this room that I don't like. I like every one of you. But I know that we are completely, 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 completely divided in this nation politically as well as on the science surrounding the virus. We are, we are really separated. I am somewhere in the middle on both sides of this. i got to be honest with you. I, 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 I know how they're using this to a degree to try to control us, and I know how they're using this to a certain degree to bring fear in us and bring forth a new system of, of control worldwide. I know this. But I also know that it's real. And now we're starting to see it even here as a few people gotten sick. It's real. It's a real thing. And you might say, well, only 1% dies. No big deal until that 1% is somebody in your family. Then it is a big deal. I've had many people tell me personally, and I didn't really go by that, but I've been reading articles, looking at television programs, looking at a couple of Christian newscast programs that said prophetically, prophetically, that God has spoken forth through different prophetic people and said that God's church has been very disobedient this whole year concerning this virus by refusing to wear a mask. God's church has been disobedient. So I didn't say it. I didn't speak it. I just heard it said. All I'm saying here is there comes a point when we got to say, look, whether I believe in the science or not, whether I believe it's for control or not, if it's come home to roost, if people around me are dying, if people are getting sick, maybe it would behoove me in closed settings to start wearing the mask. Not wearing it in your car, not wearing it in your bedroom when you go to sleep at night like some people do, not wearing it in your house or when you're outside cutting your grass, but wearing it in closed settings when you're gathering with many people. I think until we start doing some of these things, there could be a measure of disobedience even with the body of Christ when it comes to the, the science or the perceived science. I'll leave it at that. But so far, I've told you that obedience starts with us recognizing that he is the creator and we are the creation, and it also starts by bringing order and justice. Without obedience, there is no order and justice. But now I want to close this out with a good, with a good point for you. The last point I want to give you, the reason why we should be obedient is because obedience brings joy. 
You know what joy is? Some of us don't have joy anymore because it's been a bad year. We've lost our joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. If you forgot what that word joy is, it, our, our church is named after that. Joy and praise fellowship. You see? Obedience brings joy. I was telling you earlier about, about an episode that happened a while back ago. I'm going to share it to you right now. Don't you remember when, when Cain did not give the Lord a good sacrifice, but Abel did? And Cain was upset because God was unpleased with his sacrifice. But what did God tell Cain? He said, don't you know that if you do what was right, you'd be accepted. But be careful because if you're not careful, what's going to happen? Sin's going to be crouching at your door. In other words, he's saying, if you would just be, dis- if you would just be obedient instead of disobedience, you'd be happy right now. You'd be full of joy like, like, your brother, like your brother Abel is. But because you're disobedient, it didn't give the proper sacrifice. Now you're upset. And he says, if you're not careful, sin will crouch at your door. And what happened later? Not only did sin crouch at his door, but sin caused him to rise up in his spirit, and he killed his brother. Killed his brother. He blamed, he blamed his brother for being obedient and justified it by killing off his brother. And what did God say? He says, I hear your brother's blood crying out to me from the ground. Hmm. Ain't that something? See, many of us this past year, Christians, have been tricked into feeling like it's not very joyous to be a Christian anymore. We got to fight the devil every single day. We got to fight the news media every single day. You know, we're, we're, we're fighting each other, it seems like, every single day. It's, it's not joyous anymore to serve the Lord. But I'm here to tell you something. There can be nothing more than a lie than that. Because if you and I would just be obedient to the Father, be obedient to God's Word, be obedient to the Spirit of God, be obedient to those that God places over us, the Bible said that God will help us experience what's called the fullness of joy. Not just some joy, but the fullness of joy means our joy is full, it's tapped out. But a lot of times we don't have any joy, and maybe we don't have any joy because we're walking in disobedience. Not total disobedience, not like I'm just, you're, you're a bunch of criminals in this room. No, just a measure of disobedience. You ever heard a phrase called sin in the camp? You know that if, 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 a, few small, if, if, if a few bad apples spoil the bunch, if that's the case, then why would we think that that, that sin won't spoil the, spoil the batch either in our lives. We cannot have, you know, we cannot do all these great things and yet still have that sin there, that just that pet sin that we don't want to lay down. And sometimes, folks, I'm not saying tonight, I'm not playing judge with you, I'm just being messenger. Sometimes that sin that we have is disobedience. Refusal to listen to God, refusal to listen to those he places over us in authority, whether it be that boss man at work, whether it be, you know, somebody else. Just that, it's just that boss man. That boss man approach, we, just don't, we, don't, we don't like it, so we get upset. How many of you know that Christians should be the happiest people on the earth? The key word there is should. We should be the happiest people on the earth, but so often we walk around with gloomy faces and heads down where we should be, we should be joyful. We should be the happiest people. We got salvation, man. Do you know that any, that any day now we could be meeting Jesus? Any day now you could be going into your mansion? You ain't got to finish paying your bills here. Leave it to somebody else. Just move on. Diabetes be gone. Heart disease be gone. Cancer be gone. Just like that. You're just there, man. It's, it happens, bam, just like that. You know? You know why we celebrate when a believer goes to heaven? Because their troubles are gone. They're with the Lord. It's gone. It's over with, man. You know? I've had a couple of precious saints, precious brothers and sisters that have gone on to be with the Lord this last year. You know? Brother Dave, Kathy's precious husband. You know? Ernest, Ernest first, Mer- Murchison, which is Bernice's husband, you know? And I didn't know CJ, but, you know, Scott speaks highly of CJ, his brother, you know, and, and um, um, Howard just went on as well, you know. These people are not worrying no more. These people don't have to deal with COVID. They ain't got to deal with politicians. They ain't got to deal with nothing. They are just basking in the glory of Jesus, happy, waiting for the day to see us. Norma, Miss Norma, oh, Miss Norma, she's, she's really rocking, you know. 
And you know what? They're not sitting up there like saying, oh, it's taken so long, Lord, to go get my children. They live in a place where there is no time, eternity. When we go to, if we go to see heaven, it might have been 50 years or 40 years since one of our loved ones passed away, but to them it would have been seconds ago because they live in a place where there is no time. To us, it seemed like forever. To them, they just happened to them. They just got there. That's pretty incredible if you ask me. But I want to give you a scripture here about, about obedience and about how obedience leads to joy. Look what Jesus says here in John 15, verses 10 through 11. Jesus says this. He says, once again, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Then he says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Look at that. He starts off by saying, if you, right, will keep my commandments, starts with obedience, that obedience will lead to what? Love in the Father's love. And once you abide in the Father's love, it leads to what? Full joy. Without obedience, there is no love. Without no love for God, there is no joy. You cannot have love and you cannot have joy and love without having obedience. You have to be obedient. We have to be obedient to the will of the Father if we're ever going to experience that fullness of joy that God talks about. We can't walk around as rebellious kids and not, and not exp and, and experience the joy. It doesn't work that way. You know, in my house, so my kids are all grown now, but when my kids were small, you can tell when they came to church if they were experiencing joy in the car on the way here or raft. You can tell. If they were obedient the way here, they weren't fighting in the back seat with each other, they weren't spilling their juice all over the car, they weren't doing bad things, oh, they have fullness of joy. They were smiling, they were happy, going, oh, skipping off the children's church. But if they were being disobedient, dad pulled off the side of the road and took out the whipping. And they came here crying, and there wasn't, there wasn't tears of joy either. It was tears, it was tears of pain, okay, because they were disobedient. You see, following Jesus... Obeying his word, obeying his will leads to overflowing happiness and joy. But disobedience does not at least to sorrow. You see, I think the reason why we sometimes um, miss that is because we try to justify the means. We try to find our own joy on our own, on our own level and our own timing the way we want to do it. And God is saying, you're really, you're shortchanging yourself because my joy is the fullness of joy. Your joy is a temporary joy, and it's going to be lacking. I like the way um, a, this writer here named D.A. Carson, he put it. Listen to this. He says, true freedom and joy is not doing what we please, but doing what we ought. It's in that principle where one finds joy and freedom. Think about that. He says that, that, that true freedom and joy is not doing what we please, but doing what we ought. Ought many ought to. Doing what we are told. If we would do what we're told, he says, that is the principle that finds a person joy and freedom. But when we have to have it our way, I've always said that sometimes we think that all of life is Burger King, you know, have to have it your way. No, it's not our way. It's God's way. And sometimes God says yes, and sometimes God says no. But you can believe whenever God says no, it's for our good purpose. Father knows best. Remember that show when we were kids, Father knows best? Some of you young people never heard of it before. Father knows best. Father does know best. I'm going to give you a, quick, a couple of reasons in life, and we'll be, we'll be done here tonight, on why we should be obedient in a lot of different areas. How about in, in to our parents, for example? Paul says in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Think about that. He's saying if you and I would just honor our parents or our kids will honor us, right? Honor your father and mother, which is a commandment. That commandment comes with a promise. A promise. And that promise is that all will go well with you and that you will enjoy long life. You know why you won't enjoy long life if you're, if you're ugly to your parents? Because they'll probably kill you. Being obedient to your parents, God says, come with a promise. And that promise is long, sustaining life. And I talk to a lot of the saints that I've known that have lived in their 70s and 80s and 90s. And I say, what's the secret? Good dieting? What? They go, I honor my mom and dad. I honor God. 
you know, did the right things, it all comes back around, okay? Another way, how about our money? Do we, do we, are we disobedient our money? How about the, the very practical passage that we, that, we, that we tend to go to in Malachi 3.10? Bring all the tithe into the storehouse so there will be enough food for me in my temple. He said, if you do, said the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. He says, try it. Put me to the test. Now think about this. He's saying, bring the whole tide, not a portion of it, the whole tide into the storehouse. The storehouse is the church, folks, the church. And he says, so that my church, my, 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 my house will have enough food in it to meet the people, if you will. And he said, if you do so, I will open up the windows of heaven, get this, and give you such a blessing you won't be able to contain it. I saw a thing on TV one day where out of, a, out of a helicopter they dropped a bag full of money. And all the money was floating down and they, they turned the kids loose on the baseball field to go out there and get as much money they can get, right? And these kids were getting the money and they were putting it in their pocket and the, they were falling out of their pockets and they were, putting, they were falling out everywhere. They were putting it in their pants. They were falling out. They couldn't contain it all. I don't know about you guys, but that's a good problem to have. Imagine you have so much money, you're walking around and your money's just falling out of your pocket. You can't even contain it. And he said, this is what you will have if you'll be be obedient to giving to my house in the full tithe. Oh, pastor, I can't give it. I can't give it. The reason why you can't give it is because you won't give it. If you will start giving it, then you will never say, I can't give it anymore because you will always have it. You will have that blessing. And I know right now I'm surprised we haven't had three or four of you go to the bathroom at this time. Because usually when people go to the bathroom, we're talking about money. But the Bible said, do not put the Lord to the test. But yet here God says, test me in this. I double dare you. I prove it to you is what God is saying. Again, you don't think the saints are being disobedient? Well, let's, let's put it this way. When you got all these years since Jesus went back to heaven, over 2,000 years now, the word still has it that roughly 80% of the money given by 20% of the people, that tells me there's a lot of disobedience still in the body of Christ even when it comes to money. I didn't make up the, the, the odds. They're there. The facts and figures speak for themselves. How about being disobedient to the word of God? Luke eleven twenty seven 27 to 28 says this. Jesus was saying these things, and a woman in the crowd, she called out to him, and she said, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He said, No, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey. Listen to that. Jesus says, blessed are you, man, that, that, and the mother who nursed you. You're such an awesome, awesome person, Jesus. He says, no, uh No, I'm not. Blessed is the person that hears the word of God and obeys it. What has Clint been saying? I've been saying, don't just hear the word, but do what it says. Jesus says, the obedience is not hearing it, but doing it. Not hearing it, but doing it. And doesn't it say in 1 Samuel 15, 22, the prophet Samuel said, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fats of ram. He said obedience is better than sacrifice. We get them confused. Oh, I'm at church. Oh, I'm giving. Oh, I'm that's sacrifice. You know, I'm tired. I, I came to church today, but I'm tired. You're sacrificing. You're tired and you're sacrificing. Obedience, when you, is when you come, regardless of how you feel, and you're joyous, and you're giving to God, and you're ministering on behalf of God, and you're doing all you can for God despite what you feel. That's obedience. Do I have to tell any of you that I have a, I have a time or two when I'm giving the word to y'all where I don't feel quite well? You know, there was this, there was this um, joke. I said it to some of you before, but we have new people. Maybe you can hear it. There's this joke that... That what this man, he said to his wife, he goes, I don't really want to go to church today. And she said, well, you need to go to church. Well, why? Tell me why do I got to go to church today? She goes, well, you're the pastor. <laughs> Even pastors sometimes don't want to go because the flesh. You wake up with a backache. You wake up with a headache. You wake up nauseous. You wake up this. You wake up that, Right? You find out they just changed the football game to your favorite, your favorite team playing at 10 o'clock that morning instead of 1 o'clock, right when you're having service. You know, things of that nature. The flesh. But you come anyway. Why? 
out of obedience to God, you come and you do what God tells you to do, knowing that he will richly reward you for your obedience. So as I close tonight, what I'm saying to you are is this. It's hard to give this kind of message on a Wednesday because usually Wednesday people are pretty obedient, you know. Not that Sunday people aren't. Cause I hope that most of our church is obedient. I hope that most of the, of the church across the globe is obedient. But the fact of the matter is there is a lot of us that are not truly obedient, whether it be to our parents, whether it be in money, whether it be in our time, treasure, or, or talents. We're not obedient. And God is saying, I desire obedience over sacrifice. I want you to give to me joyfully. I want you to honor those that I placed over you joyfully. I want you to honor me joyfully. And if you'll do this, God's saying, he will pour such blessings in our lives, like he said with the money that we can't, that we can't even contain. So with that being said, can you stand tonight? You've been such a great audience. I went over a little bit tonight, but that's okay. It's a good word. So, Father God, tonight in Jesus' name, I pray, God, that we would indeed, those of us in this building, those of us that didn't turn off the stream already, will be people that are determined to be obedient. Because we know, God, that obedience is at the very heart of a relationship with you. And we pray, dear God, that as much value as we place in faith, as much value as we place in love, as much value as we place in humility and, and faithfulness, God, and grace and mercy, God, may we place the same, that same um, measure of, 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 of thought in obedience, God. God, help us to be people that are found obedient, God. Obedient to the will of the Father. Obedient to the commands you've given us, God. And I pray that once we are obedient, God, that you would then in turn shower us with your blessings, pour out your grace on us, God, in such a way that we can't contain it. Bless your people tonight in this building. Bless those viewing us from home tonight. Heal our sick bodies. Raise up our weariness, God. Help us, God, to be people that overcome. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And be with us tonight as we go home tonight. Put a hedge of protection around our automobiles. Keep us safe. And until we come back again and gather again today, then one day this coming Sunday, be with us, God. Bless us, and may you be glorified. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Greet each other in the Lord. Have a great, safe night tonight. We'll see you. God bless you on Sunday. Worship team, remember, no practice tomorrow night, worship team. We'll see you guys bright and early Sunday morning.